name is Willie Moore, and your MC from the Strasi Cree Nation, alongside Chief Neep, Derek Nipanak from Piney Creek First Nation, who, who is the lead facilitator. So, so first order of business today is the summary, the welcome remarks from Chief. Right after the remarks, we're going to go to the presentation. That presentation is going to, um, going to be on treaty relationship and treaty right to health. And that's going to be done by Paul Sarchan, an Indigenous rights lawyer. Paul is going to share with us treaty and Aboriginal rights, the role of law, medicine, chess clause, principles for a just treaty relationship, and uh, towards federal health legislation. So he's going to talk about the process and the parties involved. So after Paul's presentation, you know, like uh, yesterday, Paul had mentioned he was looking forward to this presentation. That's going to be presentation is going to be on place place-based options for First Nations healthcare delivery and governance, what do models in other countries have to offer. And that's going to be done by Dr. Caroline Tui. Dr. Tui is a professor and a senior fellow. And she's going to share with us institutional models to consider for First Nations who wish to access, taking on the responsibility of providing health care to their members on reserve and also advantages and disadvantages of the various models. And finally, it's the discussion, the implications for First Nations healthcare delivery and governance. So after that, after Dr. Tui's presentation, Chief Nipanak is going to do a reflection on their presentation. Then that's going to lead us to the summary of principles, recommendations, next steps, facilitated dialogue. And that's going to be done by our lead facilitator, Chief Nipanak. And that's going to lead to the closing remarks, and that'll wrap up the first, of the, the second day and the first session, first seminar of many seminars to come on the legislation engage, uh, engagement. So I'm going to do a. <coughs> so for those guests that are joining us online, good morning, Paul. We see you. So again, the background there, the recap why we were here. You know, in 2019, Prime Minister Trudeau mandated the Minister of Indian Affairs to co-develop distinctions based, indigenous-based health legislation, back to the investments needed to, uh, back to the investments needed to deliver high-quality health care for all indigenous peoples. The government's commitment to expedite this work through co-development with First Nations. Inuit and the Métis Nation was expressed in, in the September 2020 speech from the throne and 2020 fall economic statement. Now it's 15.6 million over two years, starting in 2021, for Indigenous Service Canada work collaboratively with these distinct groups. This co-development will happen in two stages. Broad engagement to determine the co-development pathway and co-development of legislative options. And that is guided by the TRC's call to action, the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, the National Enquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, calls for justice, and the principles respecting the Governor General's Canada relationship with Indigenous peoples. Engagement is neither an endorsement nor co-development, but it will inform a specific co-development process or structure. The purpose, is the, the purpose of the seminar is to provide the educational foundation for informed decision-making by Manitoba First Nations to explain what federal health legislation about First Nations might mean with a focus on government policies and obligations as well as treaties and First Nation rights. This seminar is consistent with the work FINISM is mandated to do. Key themes that emerged from yesterday's proceedings were the federal government has maintained Maintained it has no legal obligations to provide health services to First Nations. Instead, has taken a policy approach. And Chief Nipanak had uh, good comments on that yesterday in, in, uh, in relation to treaty, treaty right to health. And he'll elaborate on more after I'm done the recap. The federal government's commitment to co-develop health legislation in First Nations can be viewed as an opportunity because it reflects a shift in its legislative agenda to take more a holistic approach how citizens are governed under the Constitution recognition of inherent and treaty rights. Yesterday it was noted that this can be done without compromising the treaty rights to health. 
It reflects another federal shift in the liberal, liberal government's belief in equality and human rights and recognition of deficiencies in current health services and resulting disparities. This opportunity to co-develop and legislation also reflects a shift in First Nation communities too towards land-based activities and increased youth activities to in integrate holistic health. And again, uh, Ch Chief Nipanako is uh, talking about examples of this community, the, the young people, how they're getting back to the land. So you'll have, you'll, <coughs> you'll elaborate on more of that as well. Co-development legislation can enable us to address gaps experienced with policy approaches such as lack of holistic approach by the federal government, need for a better alignment for the culture of people being served, emph emphasis on prevention and not just on treatment, inter-jurisdictional inter issues, lack of health professionals where needed, need for capacity building at community level, systematic racism, systemic racism, the impacts of Indian residential school and the need for reconciliation and accountability back to the people being served. Yesterday, the, consider the considerations included the 1971 Wabung, Our Tomorrow's Leadership made numerous recommendations and proclaimed, quote, we maintain the health services should be included in federal legislation respecting the rights of Indians, end quote. The Royal Commission Aboriginal People's recommendations, which are still relevant today, the Kelowna Accord strategies, but are also to be cautious of challenges experienced in that instance, namely a change in government. And in the, uh, the Kelowna Accord, like Chief Nipanak was saying, was negotiated at the 11th hour. The Canada Health Act and its program criteria and conditions, understanding the difference between policy and legislation and the, process of each, the processes of each. Canadian constitutional legal, legal considerations include exploring questions such as, this is one of the questions, who makes the decisions and who, those decisions that matter in the health and well-being of treaty nations. It was stated in the ultimate product from this process we are engaging in, we are engaging in, should include thinking about and asking what principles should guide us and what recommendations should be made to the government by the treaty nations. Principles are values and ideas that should guide the actions of people because we want to avoid the arbitrariness and speak generally accepted ideas of what is the right thing to do. Legislation should not be arbitrary, but should be principle and defi uh, defeasible, defensible. Several principles and recommendations were put forth for consideration, such as that the federal government adopt General Comment 2000, which is an international covenant of economic, social, and cultural rights as a guiding principle, and I believe by Paul, uh, Paul Main mention in General Comment 2000. So, concluding remarks from yesterday's session included one, political unity is needed, including a unified message from all political organizations. The certainty of health services that Manitoba of First Nations called for in 1971 has survived into 2022, so 50 years. First Nations health legislation is not all, not an all or nothing proposition. First Nations have been a, First Nations have been uh, accommodified that makes governance, uh, governance and industry much money. Oh, so it's typo there. There's an indebtedness owed to First Nations because of treaty. First Nations should question government on spending cutbacks, cost reductions, not a motivating factor for why we are doing this, but rather it, it is a political factor. And finally, more time is needed to engage community and frontline workers that are living proof of treaty rights. And that is why the First Nation Health and Social Secretariat of Manitoba is having these important le health legislation engagement seminars so the first series of meetings, there's going to be some more sessions, seminars coming in the next few weeks. Hopefully we get uh, more people participating, you know, more leadership, health directors and frontline workers. So that was a recap of day one yesterday. You know, it was good, uh, good discussion, good presentations. So at this time, I'm going to take it over, 
take it over to the lead facilitator for his reflections on day one, Chief Derek Nipanak of Pine Creek First Nation. Now it's on, I think. Miigwech, Willie. Um, <clears throat> Ujo Anishinaabek, Nuchu Aganak, Nibin Makwa, Indigena Kazmakwan, Tolotem. Good morning. Um, Derek Nipanak, I'm the Chief of the Minigol Zibi Anishinaabek, and I welcome everybody back to the circle today to continue our discussion in this initial engagement and strategies session on the uh, issue of federal health legislation for Indigenous people. Yesterday was a very, I, I found to be a very dense. Um, dense content in terms of uh, so much information, valuable information that we all need, of course, to advance the discussion to a place where decisions can be made. But nonetheless, uh, very, very packed, uh, a very packed agenda full of information that's going to help, I think, lead to um, really, really thorough and, and good discussions on where we can take this opportunity before us. Um, appreciate Willie's summary of what happened yesterday and um, I don't really have a lot to add. I know that oftentimes we get into some a little bit of redundancy and reiterating points that are important and that's I think a cultural thing sometimes when we hear the same message carried over and over again. Um, I think it's it's meant for emphasis and one of the emphasis that I wanted to make was the fact that the call for federal health legislation goes back to the very early organization of our political um, positions here in Manitoba. You know, we reflect back on the creation of the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood and the leadership of the day, very strong treaty-based leadership. Um, you know, and some of us remember some of the, some of the Wabung chiefs um, and some of the positions that they took. But one of the, th the one that stands out here today, of course, is that they called for federal health legislation to create some certainty around uh, the quality and the level of the services for health, uh, health services provided to Indigenous people from our communities. And as Willie mentioned, that, that, that message has survived into today's political discussion. And, and <clears throat> messages that are true, messages that, that have really solid backing often survive you know, the ebb and flow of, of what's popular in political spaces. And of course, this one has survived all this time, which tells me that it's obviously clearly a, a, an ongoing and con, uh, considerable priority for us as, as Indigenous people here, even in the context of treaty, which I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing more from um, in Paul's presentation coming up right away. So those are my, my thoughts from, from yesterday. Um, I know that a lot of this feeds into a broader discussion, which is going to draw in, you know, political leadership from across the uh, the province of, of Manitoba, but also the treaty territories that overlap into other jurisdictions like Ontario, Saskatchewan, and so forth. And then, of course, the broader, even broader table uh, through the uh, uh, the national discussion, perhaps at the AFN level or 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 some other organization. So, you know, with that said, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to where this is all going to head. It's um, been a good conversation so far, and um, I, um, I hope we have a good, good day today. I know we've got a short agenda, and um, but once again, it's going to be power-packed, and it's going to be very insightful for us to take back to our, uh, our respective circles um, and, and to continue this discussion. So looking forward to what happens in our, uh, in our agenda going forward today. Miigwech. Miigwech. Derek Nipanag from Pine Creek First Nation. So we got our next presenter online. Paul, are you there? So we're gonna do a check first. Good morning. Hey, hey, he's back, folks. <laughs> we missed you. <laughs> so Paul's gonna be our next presenter. Paul's gonna be doing a presentation on treaty relationship and treaty right to health. So he has five, five, uh, five parts to his presentation. Just a heads up there, Paul, for our IT team. So if uh, during your PowerPoint presentation, if you can give him a heads up when you are switching slides. And just one request, we are at 9, 9.30 here, because uh, our next presenter, 
She's really uh, on a tight schedule. Dr. Caroline Tui, she's requesting to be uh, to present right at 10.15. So we got 45 minutes, so I think we have more than enough time for Paul's presentation, followed up by Q&A by our lead facilitator, Chief Nipanak. So without further ado, we're going to take uh, give the floor to Mr. Paul Sarchand, and for those people that uh, just joined us on uh, online, Paul is an Indigenous, long-time Indigenous lawyer, long-time Indigenous right advocate, and a uh, guy that no, he needs no introduction. So, Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you can expect, I've... Uh, I've been around in many, many conferences and seminars, and uh, when you said uh, uh, needs no introduction, it reminded me of something <laughs> quite funny that I heard one time uh, in opening up uh, a conference and introducing a speaker, and the, the chairman got a little bit, uh, uh, you know, mixed up, and he said, uh, and here is uh, Mr. Smith a man who deserves no introduction. <laughs> so anyway, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be able to uh, uh, thank the uh, FNISM and the wonderful team that it has put together to, uh, 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 to uh, follow its mandate uh, to do its best to ensure that the decisions made by the chiefs in Manitoba about the proposed federal health legislation is uh, is going to be a decision or decisions that are made with clear eyes, that are decisions that are based on a consideration of all the relevant uh, factors. So. I begin again by emphasizing the mandate of uh, the uh, FNISM. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the mandate is, is to do its work, research, and, and, and so on, uh, to promote the participation of Manitoba First Nations in the control and delivery of health, but the general proviso is that this must all be done on the foundation of the treaties. And so this is where we start. And we go back to that, that title. If we may go back to the uh, title of this uh, uh, presentation, uh, if, if it's possible for the machinery to go back, I don't know if you, if you got a, a reverse gear on your machines here that, uh, that operate these slides or not, but the the first uh, uh, the, there it is the treaty relationship and the treaty right to health let's just consider that uh, for a moment <clears throat> to try to have a a useful discussion about uh, things uh, it's helpful to have a common idea about how we think about things, in particular, how we think about the world and how we think about words. So in my respectful view, if we're approaching something like the complex issues that we're dealing with in the seminar, it might be uh, helpful if we appreciate the uncertainty of the world. Though, uh, there are uh, those who tend to see the world as having snappy answers to any question that anybody asks. There is, uh, again, borrowing from a title of a book that I read decades ago, uh, the idea of the wisdom of uncertainty. That is, uh, as human beings, we cannot know everything. So uh, rather than think that there are hard answers to any question that come up with, perhaps the uh, uh, a useful approach is simply to recognize the uncertainty of the world. And that, that's, in my respectful view, what I think about when people say it's a wonderful world. It's a world to wonder at. You know, so 
Let's look at the words re treaty relationship and treaty right to health. What is that about? Well, a lot of a lot of people talk about treaty rights, but what are they talking about? What is a right? Uh, the, the the idea of a right, at least from the perspective of lawyers in the Canadian and North American uh, legal systems, is a, a particular intellectual tool. And let me just simplify that by saying, generally speaking, when one raises the issue of the existence of a right, what that means is that someone else has an obligation. A right means there's an obligation. Someone has an obligation to do something. There are other words to show different kind of relationship. A freedom, for example, might sound pretty close to a right, but in the case of a freedom, you see no one else has an obligation to do anything about it. You're free to do a particular thing, but there's no corresponding obligation on anyone. So uh, that is thinking that has been developed for over 100 years uh, in, in uh, legal philosophy in uh, North America. So uh, what we are talking about essentially, when we're talking about a treaty right to health, is we're talking about relationships. We're talking about relationships. I say to you that all law is relationships. Law governs relationships between peoples and things. And of course, in different cultures, say in Anishinaabe law, uh, in Iowa law, uh, the relationships might involve uh, persons or parties or entities other than the ones that are recognized by the laws in Canada. This is uh, important. Uh, for example, there is a, a trend nowadays, I don't know if you're aware of it, but there is a tendency, and it has come to Canada, for the law to recognize the, the rights of mat uh, natural things. Rivers, for example, rivers have rights, mountains have rights. So that raises the question, what, what is the relationship of people to those other things? So the idea of a treaty right to health is a, a, a complex issue. And it, if we're thinking about it, it invites us to think about the very way that we think. What are our habits of thought? And I think it, it, it helpful once in a while to to reflect on that as uh, as I, I i think we are we are doing uh, today so let us go on uh, and have a look at uh, slide number two if we might a treaty right to health let's uh, briefly look at the treaty right to health what are we talking about, thinking about. Well, let me start by saying that it, the Constitution of Canada has written parts and unwritten parts. And the written part in 1982 affirms and recognizes treaty rights. Now, as I was saying, a right usually means someone else has an obligation. Now, let's look at what the treaty right to health might mean a bit a bit further. What is a treaty, essentially? A treaty, in the view, at least, of uh, people in Canada who thought, who talked about this or written about this, is that it's an important agreement. An agreement, that means that it requires a meeting of the minds, that the, the minds have the same thing in mind an important agreement between Canada and a treaty nation that was recognized historically as an exercise of a royal prerogative to recognize foreign nations and Aboriginal peoples. What does that mean? The law in Canada, the law of Canada, has developed from the law of the English. The relationships 
that the law governs in Canada is based on the ideas, the history, and the culture of the English. That's where it comes from. So we find then the peculiarities of English culture and English history. So they've had kings, bosses, big bosses, well, the king. And in the history and culture of the English, that big boss could do all sorts of different things all on his own, on his own steam. That's called a royal prerogative. And nowadays, the government of Canada has certain powers that it can exercise that comes from that ancient power in the English history and, uh, and culture. And there were uh, the royal prerogative, which is still, uh, uh, is still alive today, was used and has been used to recognize foreign nations. So it's not the judges who decide if uh, Canada is going to recognize Taiwan or North Korea or, or Belgium. That's the executive government, the government of the day that has that role. In the same way, it's not the judges, it's the executive arm of the government that will recognize an, a treaty nation and enter into the treaty. The point is that, as you know from your history, the historical treaties were entered into between representatives of the government and the treaty nations, and this was done from the side of Canadian law on the basis of the powers of the executive government, that is representatives of the government came and entered into the treaties. So uh, this is one of the important points that is behind my criticism of the initial case called Pauli, where for the first time in history, the judges recognized an Aboriginal people. So I think that's a very significant departure from the way things have been. Now, back to the treaties here, the historic treaties, the, the, the treaties that we see in Manitoba. A treaty entered into between the representatives of Canada on one hand and its government and another entity logically must have recognized that there were two parties one was a political society, wasn't the same political group. And it was also a distinct legal order. So there are two sets of laws, two, distri two distinct polities and, and who entered into a treaty. What that means then is that the very existence of the treaties implies legal pluralism in Canada, which means that the more than one system of laws operates in Canada. This point is often obscured for the reason that the world has been dominated by states and by states that have claimed all the power. This is a recent modern development that we can uh, you know, look back to was really starting in 1648 in the Peace of Westphalia in Europe. These are modern things. The state is a modern thing. So instead of having a lot of local communities that know best what is good for them and, and where relationships are governed by their own local laws, we have one big entity called Canada, which says I'm the only one that is going to make laws. So that is one of the basic challenges when we're talking about the treaty relationships and treaty rights is to say, well, why is it that we must have only one set of laws? Why can we not have two sets of laws? And when we look at the history of the treaties, we find that, well, if, if there was a, a, a treaty, it must mean that there, it was recognized that there are two societies with two sets of laws. Next slide, please. Now, the first point here is that the constitutional law of Canada, that's the law that 
contains the identification of the powers of government. In other words, what the government can do and what the government cannot do. That's what a constitution does. So if you're asking about what's the treaty relationship like, what's it all about, what are its features, the answer is we don't, it's not fully developed. It has not been done yet because it has to be done from both sides. There are two, the, the big challenge here is we have a relationship between two parties, but those two parties must be united in a common intention. So what we're looking for, if we're looking for treaty rights or treaty relationships, is to identify the common intention between two different parties. Now, the next point is one that is not always appreciated, I think. If you look at Section 35, the Constitution Act 82, it ref affirms and recognizes treaty rights. But a relationship entered into in a treaty is not necessarily fully and properly described by the idea of rights. Each nation will have its own idea of relationships. You'll have its own idea of what's a good treaty relationship and what that treaty relationship involves. And in my professional life, I've noticed a lot of people have just talked about treaty rights, treaty rights, treaty rights. But if you talk to the elders, if you talk to those who know about the philosophy and the history of treaty nations, you might find that relationships are thought about and spoken about in a different way, not in a way of rights, but in some other way. And because the view of that treaty party must be, must be identified and recognized, that is a necessary process to inquire into that. So it's important to inquire into the, the ideas of relationships within the philosophy, the history of a treaty nation. And you cannot have an understanding of the treaty relationship without that. So what it means is the third bullet is that simply looking at the treaty text cannot by itself explain the common intention of the treaty parties. The view of the treaty nation is necessary. Even Canada's courts have agreed with that. So you cannot say what a treaty means simply by going to the record uh, and having a look at the text of the treaty. That won't do it. Now, the last point in the slide three is that there's no settled authority in Canadian law on the treaty right to health in the Numbers Treaty. There's no settled authority as a matter of Canadian law. There's some authority, but there's no settled authority. The way the legal system works is that something is finally known and reasonably certainly known only when there is a, a high level decision on the point, usually the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada. And we don't have that, but we have pronouncements at the lower court level. Next slide, please. So what is the purpose of law in society? It's, a, it, it, it's, it, it's an interesting uh, question. From the view of those who know the law as it has operated in Canada, the purpose of the law is to resolve conflicts, to resolve conflict. This is the uh, legacy of thought that we have from the English and the development of the system of law of the English, which is usually called the common law. 
those who are not lawyers may not have heard these words before. They've said, oh, we live common law. But the common law simply means the system of law that has been recognized in the history of the English. It's the history of all the local places that was recognized as, as, as England became to be a big, a big country, a big nation, and then putting all the local laws together. What is the law of the entire nation? This was called the common law, and it has developed its own, its own history. So we have to uh, ensure that we keep in mind the difference between the law that's developed to resolve disputes between parties in courts, the law that comes from that, those decisions create law. The other laws are called statutes or legislation, and they are not created by the judges. They are created by the parliament under the control of the ruling government. Same thing in the provinces. The statutes or legislation are created by the government of the day um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and written down. Next slide, please. A little bit here on uh, uh, the law and uh, the idea of uh, resolving uh, treaty issues. So I have to tell you a little bit about how the law develops in a Canadian court. The court, <clears throat> but I'll just keep it at a very, uh, at the simplest level. The courts will reach decisions according to a method that was developed over hundreds of years in England. One of the basic principles that the courts use in coming to decisions to resolve disputes is that what was done before in a similar situation deserves a close look. So what was done before is very important. If this was done before and it was thought to be good, we must have a very good look at it and see if it cannot be used to resolve the dispute before us. That's the idea in precedent. <clears throat> now, there are other features of the common law method, and I will not be going through them, but one of the important features of any system of lawmaking must be its, its uh, eye to the future. Uh, human beings, judges included, can only decide what's within their knowledge and understanding now. They cannot decide cases for the future that is unknown. And so the way that the common law courts deal with that is they decide only as much as is necessary, only what is necessary. Uh, <clears throat> this is the idea of minimalism. The idea of minimalism is an idea that don't do more than you have to. And that's a, a great idea that applies in many aspects of life. Don't do more, don't create more institutions, don't do things that you don't have to. So minimalism is a very important part of the lawmaking uh, and it gives some flexibility to precedent. That is, it gives some flexibility to the idea that what was done before is, uh, we should have a close look at it to see if we could do that again. So. My next point is this, that at least speaking for myself, one can be critical of the way that the courts in Canada have developed the law. They've done a, quite a number of things that I think are, uh, are uh, certainly not in the best interests of treaty nations, uh, certainly uh, uh, not uh, uh, faithful to earlier decisions 
on the relationships between the federal government, the provincial governments, and the treaty nations. Uh, the, uh, the biggest uh, challenge is the result of the of recent decisions of the courts of Canada, Supreme Court of Canada, that have done what was objected to in Wabong, says do uh, keep keep the federal role of protection of our treaty rights in the federal government. But what Canada's courts have done is they've not been faithful to that. Uh, the, the, the courts of Canada and some decisions in 2014 have now said, oh no, the provinces also have the responsibility to implement the treaties. But, you know, we say that they can also infringe the treaties. All they have to do to uh, legally infringe the treaties is they have to satisfy us, the judges, that the infringement is good, that it is justified. So these, these are some of the, that's just one of the points to illustrate the point that the, the, the laws of Canada, as they are developed by the courts of Canada, are not necessarily courts that are going to decide in the best interests of the treaty, of the treaty nations. Uh, one of the uh, basic propositions at least that I stand by, is that uh, people know best what is good, what is good for them. And uh, it's difficult to believe that it will be Canada's courts that will know best what is good for their treaty nations. So one of the big challenges for those thinking about uh, the treaty, as is the mandate of FNISM, and thinking about potential federal health legislation is a question, well, will, will that health legislation be legitimate? That is, will it be acceptable to us? Is this something that will be acceptable? As Chief Nipinak has said, the chiefs in Manitoba have a long history of urging federal health legislation, but that was in the context of protection against local interest, which is in Section 9124, the Constitution Act 1867. There's a very important idea behind a constitutional um, uh, provision, which says that it's the federal, the central government that must protect the treaty nations against local interests, because that's where interests are going to clash. You're more likely to get into a dispute with your neighbor than you are likely to get into a dispute with someone who lives uh, halfway across the country. So that's why there's always been the policy of British imperial governments to keep the power regarding the indigenous people away from local governments. That old idea has now been destroyed by court decisions. Now, one big question in, in thinking about treaty issues and tre thinking about possible federal health legislation is to say, are the courts of Canada now good enough? Are they acceptable? Or on the other hand, should we create new courts? Should we create special courts and put on it only people who know about the treaty relationship, whoever, we have to reason to believe they will be good at making those kinds of decisions. And of course, uh, uh, such courts to be fair, would have to have representation from the treaty nation side and from the Canadian side. And if the government says now it's committed to the ideas in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and that declaration says not only must Canada respect the treaties, but it also says that Canada must develop fair dispute resolution mechanisms. So what that includes is fair courts, courts that can legitimately make fair decisions in resolving disputes on the treaty relationship. Next uh, slide, please. We'll come to a much debated uh, uh, 
aspect of the treaty relationship, uh, the numbered treaties, including the ones in Manitoba, have quite a number of features that are common features, but not every treaty has exactly the same uh, provisions. So one of the uh, treaty provisions that we find in Treaty 6 <clears throat> is what is called a medicine chest clause, because by and large, the words, the English words, provide for having a medicine chest uh, at the uh, at the uh, Indian agent's place to be used for the benefit of the uh, of the treaty uh, <clears throat> community. What is its meaning? Well, <clears throat> what we have from the lower court decisions suggests it is not really hard binding law, but it suggests that that medicine chest clause refers to fair access to all medical aid, all medical services that are available to others. It seems to me that's pretty close to what the, the charter already requires is that there be uh, fairness in the distribution and that there be no undue unfair discrimination amongst uh, groups. So that's really a right that all citizens have, that you should all get a full range of, uh, of uh, medical aid and services. But it so happens that Canada does not provide a full range of medical aid and services to its citizens. Canada, you may be surprised to know this, Canada ranks among the countries in the world that spends uh, as much money as anybody else pretty well uh, on uh, health care, medical services. But the results aren't that good. Canada generally ranks about 30th or worse in, in, uh, in a scale of uh, uh, providing effective uh, health care to its citizens. So we're not doing well, but uh, compared to the rest of the world. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have the, the political system has been able to develop a mythology that we have a really good system and it's, it really helps to keep the status quo. For example, no, there's no uh, dental, you know, your teeth, your eyes, they're not, they're not cared for as part of the medical uh, uh, fe the features of the medical care in Canada. So what, what can the treaty right to health mean? As I suggested yesterday, international human rights law contains a very good and, and uh, detailed uh, description of what, uh, uh, what uh, a human right to health ought to include. And we know from uh, recent Supreme Court of Canada decisions that uh, to the extent that these uh, treaty rights are part of the law of Canada, they are binding on Canada. It was very important for those who participate in the deliberations towards federal health legislation to know that Canada is not free to exercise its discretion in any way it wants and say, here, we are going to make this kind of legislation. No. Uh, the law that binds the Canadian government requires it to do certain things. And I uh, reviewed some of those things generally yesterday, and I can repeat them here briefly, is to say that uh, the uh, in respect to Indigenous people, and international customary law refers specifically to the need for national programs for indigenous people in, in Canada, that the obligation of Canada to provide funding for a national program on health, and that the idea of health for indigenous people as both an individual, personal, and a collective dimension, a community dimension, and that the health of the environment, environmental health is a part of the right to health. 
think of the example of grassy narrows and mercury poisoning, for example, for a dramatic illustration of the relationship between personal health and the health of the environment. The last point on this uh, slide, uh, six, is the right to development, which I mentioned briefly yesterday also, which is this, that the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> international human rights system recognize certain carries, categories of rights, certain categories of rights. And these are called human rights. They're human rights because they are the basic rules that govern the way that states ought to respect the very humanity of people. Those are human rights. And I mentioned yesterday that human rights now include the particular rights and the relationship between the indigenous people and the state. So these are undeniable rights, which means that they're undeniable obligations of Canada. One of these is the right to development. The right to development is, is a right, a human right, that includes political, social, economic, and cultural development. And you generally don't hear much about it because Canada is regarded as a, a first world nation, a rich nation, a developed nation. The idea that you need to develop socially, culturally, economically is usually thought of as having to do with the poorer nations around the world. So the idea of a right to development, you don't hear much talk about it, do you, in Canada? But these are very, very important rights that should be kept in mind. Whenever treaty nations are negotiating with government for legislation or for an improvement in their policies. Um, but you see, the right to development wouldn't cast Canada in a very good political light because it, it really makes the point that uh, what is called a first world country actually has parts of its population that lives in third world conditions. Next slide, please. Paul, well, let's give, uh, give you a heads up uh, in terms of time. We've got 10 minutes to conclude your presentation. That goes to the uh, the uh, reflection in Chief Nipnak as our next guest is pressed for time. She has to get going. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I propose to uh, finish at least within eight minutes, so we'll have a little bit of extra time. <laughs> um, side eight. Uh, 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 oh, uh, sorry, uh, slide seven, where are we here? Uh, I shuffled my paper while uh, uh, talking there. Principles for a just relationship. What principles might apply? Uh, <clears throat> there should be fairness uh, in, uh, in, in disputes. So uh, are, are the views of the treaty nations going to coincide with the views of the federal government in regards to the making of federal health legislation? Where there are disputes, what, what do we do? So if there is federal le health legislation, where, where, is the, uh, where is the dispute going to be resolved? So at the moment, it will go to the courts of Canada. We see that from Bill C-92. You know, that was in regards to child and family services. That's in the courts. It's in the courts of one side, you see. But if you're dealing with the treaty, I think you have to ask the question, well, what about our side? What about the treaty nation side? You know, so the courts of Canada, decisions of those courts can't really be fair. And as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> the United Nations Declaration itself, which Canada says, we, we go along with that. We will align our laws with that requires that Canada create fair resolutions uh, tribunals. So in my respectful view, uh, 
there cannot be f fairness for treaty nations in the Canada treaty nation relationship without the creation of new institutions that can render fair decisions in those disputes. Now, <clears throat> what's the way to resolution of the different views about the meaning of medicine chest clause, the meaning of the treaty right to help? The way is to negotiate the practical and, and most straightforward approach is for the legitimate political representatives or other ways of representation or dealing of each party to negotiate an agreement. And uh, some of us have developed constitutional arguments to say the law of the Constitution does require these negotiations. And I, I have an article in a New Zealand law journal on the point and one of my former students, who's now a professor, uh, also has an article in Saskatchewan Law Review on a constitutional duty to negotiate. So the point here for folks is that uh, you can you can go to court uh, and ask the court to declare that Canada has uh, obligations to negotiate the, the treaty. So that's one option. The ultimately. Ultimately, I think the most solid approach to creating a just treaty relationship in Canada would be the process that we went through in the, the 1980s. First ministers' conferences, treaty nation leaders, and Canadian politicians to enter into negotiations to reach an agreement. It didn't work in the 1980s, but ultimately, consider that the Constitution of Canada was not designed with treaty nation in mind. It was not designed to accommodate the treaty relationship. All right, so 1982 was an attempt to deal with that. It says, well, let's negotiate it, 1982. But we had the meetings and they didn't result in a, an agreement on that. So it's an outstanding business. It's a constitutional imperative that there must be direct negotiations to resolve these questions. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that uh, there is a concern that the uh, in two departments, CERNAC and ISC, have mandates that are established by federal legislation, which came into effect in July 2019. And that the ISC that is leading the discussions here on federal health legislation does not have a legal mandate to negotiate treaties. The other department that's not around, CERNAC, it has a mandate to negotiate the treaties. Now, uh, I raised also yesterday the point that there are a number of current processes towards discussions and, and negotiations with the federal government. So where does the uh, so-called engagement on federal health legislation, how does that fit with a process towards uh, a treaty implementation? How does it fit in the Bill C-15 plan to, uh, to create an action plan? to reflect the uh, terms of the UNRWA, which requires that Canada implement and respect the treaties. So these are very important, outstanding questions that I propose. And fi the final slide, number nine. Section 35 of the Constitution Act 82 demands that Canada act to affirm and recognize the treaties, the constitution says the treaties are recognized and they are affirmed. That requires action. So the government is a constitutional outlaw to the extent that it fails to do that. It has a positive obligation to act. Second point is that uh, uh, there must uh, at least uh, be equal 
there is a, a principle that there must be equal access to the same standards of medical care and services as all, uh, as all citizens is already guaranteed uh, in Canada. So you don't, we don't have to worry about that one. The uh, contemporary standards of human rights demand that there be special agreements, not the closing the gaps, not the ISC, not the uh, equal citizenship rights approach, but rather the human rights approach which recognizes the collective dimension of health of indigenous people and that special treaty relationship. That is absolutely necessary. And I try to say thank you here in the various languages and I asked for the help of the staff here at FNISM and I didn't get any answers back. But I will conclude by pointing out my uh, sense of humor by having snuck in that Japanese uh, uh, thank you there at the bottom. Mr. Chairman, that ends my presentation. Thank you very much. Get it done again. Right on. Thank you, Paul. Get the Scott, man. Note your, uh, your closing uh, words there, Miigwetz. In the last commit to now, well, Masi Cho Wapiran. Erigado. Again, we thank you, Paul, for your time for the uh, last two days. But uh, if we're going to be connected, I'm going to uh, give you the opportunity to have some closing comments during uh, Chief Nipanak's closing uh, closing remarks and reflection. This is for for any additions that you you would like to uh, share with the delegation here in the room, but also online. So at this time, we're going to take it over to Chief Nipanak's reflections on based on Paul's presentation, and after Chief Nipanak's comments, we're going to go into Dr. Caroline Tui's presentation. Chief. Miigwech. I, I just wanted to, um, you know, once again, thank Paul for a very thorough presentation. I, um, I really like how he goes into depth and, and reflects and, and backs, his, backs his thoughts in established uh, law, uh, even at the international level. And, and I think that that's what we need to continue to promote in a discussion where we bring the treaty right to health into the, into the, into the forum. Um, what it doesn't address at times, however, is, is, is something that I'm going to raise, and that's, that's what I call, I call it political treaty. And that is, uh, you know, a, a discourse that exists out there that, that says that Canada is not really party to a treaty. The crown is, or the crown in, 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 in England is the treaty maker, and that Canada is just an agent, or, uh, or what they call, I guess, the state, the nation state. I'm not sure how that differentiates the, the discussion, but... It may be an avoidance strategy for some to um, avoid that discussion with Canada. Um, and that, that's, that's a reality out there within political treaty talk. Uh, from what I've observed is that, you know, some people will avoid engagement because they say the wrong parties are at the table. Um, there, there's arguments that go both ways in, in that discussion, but nonetheless, in, in political treaty talk, we will have that, that discussion surfacing or that challenge surfacing. Um, but other than that, I think, uh, I think it's very good that we, that we're able to engage the discussion on it from a treaty based perspective. Um, Paul mentioned at the beginning that it's really good to have a common idea when we say treaty right to health. Um, I don't think there is a common idea today. Uh, a lot of us were led to believe for a long time, there was a common theme that would go around that said, you know, as long as you can go to the pharmacy to get your prescription filled for free, then that's your treaty right to health. Um, to me, that's never really been the case. And, and um, I had originally thought that, that that's what it was, but as I, be, as, I, as I continue to grow and as I continue to reflect upon what health really meant um, in, in, in the context of the, the life that I'd created, you know, for, for myself and um, looking at what Minopamatsuin really means, uh, wellness being the, the center and the pursuit of, of many of us, um, the concepts of health as they exist within, you know, uh, non-insured health benefits or within federally sponsored health programs really fell short of what we would think of as a comprehensive wellness pursuit as, as, as Anishinaabe people, which includes, you know, more than just that human relationship or that access to, to the pharmacy. It includes, um, you know, balanced relationships throughout all of our life um, between one another, but also between ourselves and our lands and our waters. 
you know, so, so to me, a, a treaty right to health is a much more comprehensive um, consideration than um, what is the government paying for today. And, and I, I think about that oftentimes as well when people say, well, I got my treaty rights back, you know, because here's my status Indian card. And I've always struggled with that because um, you don't get your treaty rights back when the government recognizes you as a status Indian. You get your treaty rights back the moment you're born and the first breath you draw is your living treaty. And that's what the ceremony people will say and that's, that, that, that brings into light the sacredness of the treaty, which takes it beyond, <laughs> I think, the political treaty discussion into something else. So those are, those are my thoughts and I think that, you know, it's going to be a very interesting uh, next few months when we get more into, uh, when we roll up our sleeves and we have some of those political discussions around uh, the treaty right to health. But uh, miigwech, Paul, as always, uh, very, very grateful to, to, to receive your wisdom in, uh, in the discussion. Thank you, Chief. And for those people that just joined us online, Chief Derek Nipanak is the lead facilitator for a health legislation engagement seminar. So our next presenter, our next presentation, and it's a presentation on place-based options for First Nations healthcare delivery and governance. What do models in other countries have to offer? And that presentation is going to be done by Dr. Caroline Tui, who's a PhD a professor and a senior fellow. She's joining us online. Uh, just a few, thing, a few things there, uh, Caroline. If you can provide a brief bio of yourself just for, for the delegation in the room and online. And also during your presentation, if you can give the IT teams a heads up when you're uh, sw switching slides. So without further ado, Caroline, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it was a, a pleasure to listen to Paul's very thoughtful uh, and uh, and informative uh, presentation as well. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen, if possible, to uh, to show my slides. If that's uh, if that's acceptable, or or I can just go with your IT people. Yep, yeah, yeah, you can. No, no problem. You can share your slides. Go ahead. I'll I'll, I'll uh, see if I'm uh, if I'm able to do that. Um, I'm not as familiar with. Um, with Teams as I am with Zoom. So let me try this. Um, slideshow from beginning. All right, is that working for you? Yeah, perfect, we can see you. Okay, excellent. Uh, so I have uh, titled this uh, Place-Based Options for First Nations Healthcare Delivery and Governance uh, to recognize the importance of, uh, of place, of the land. Uh, and interestingly, most models of healthcare governance are place-based, are locally based because of the very nature of healthcare delivery itself. Now, I do not study uh, indigenous uh, healthcare delivery and governance. I uh, am a comparative uh, public policy scholar who studies non-indigenous models in other countries. Uh, so that's what I'll be drawing on here in the hope that they are relevant to your deliberations. And I, I think I think they are. I think there are some things that you can learn from uh, what um, what other countries are doing in the non-Indigenous space. And I must say, vice versa. I think there is a lot to be learned in non-Indigenous healthcare delivery and governance from what Indigenous people are doing. Um, not only in terms of organizational characteristics, but in terms of the recognition of, and I'm going to use a phrase that I learned from Chief Nipanak, um, well-being on the land and incorporation of a much broader concept of, uh, of health. So briefly, what I'm going to talk to you about today are six models from other nations that I think uh, might be of relevance. Um, I will uh, not spend a lot of time on the first four of these, but I will say uh, a bit more about the, the last two. 
uh, regional health authorities, which are really the most common uh, across countries. Regional uh, governments uh, in some countries actually have uh, responsibility for health care. Intergovernmental transfers, we're familiar with that in the federal uh, system in Canada. Uh, devolved authority in the UK. And then the, the two that I'll spend a little more time on are social insurance and integrated care systems. Uh, because they, uh, they may give you some ideas that you haven't considered before. Um, and then I want to consider at the end um, how you might go about thinking about the relevance of these models for your own circumstances uh, and recognizing the diversity of circumstances across First Nations. How, how much autonomy do they provide for the nation, uh, for the First Nation, um, how uh, in, in terms of real, real self-governance, uh, what sort of scale do you need to make these things work? How big do you have to be as a jurisdiction? What kinds of capacity, what kinds of resources do you have to have? To what extent can they accommodate diversity? Um, and then finally, uh, to what extent that they really subject you to what economists call transactions costs. Uh, Paul emphasized the importance of negotiation, and that is true in all of these models. Um, but can you at least find models that um, reduce the burden of continual negotiation uh, and, uh, and rely instead on, uh, on overarching agreements? Um, so let me, uh, let me proceed. Regional health authorities are the most common way of uh, governing uh, health care below the level of the central government across countries. They're very common in Canada, the UK, New Zealand, many other countries. The powers of regional health authorities, which are established for a particular purpose, um, for usually for planning uh, health services at the local level and many cases also for allocating budgets that uh, are received from the central government. Um, the advantages of these models of having a, a purpose-built uh, authority for healthcare, uh, the advantages that you might feel from these are that uh, this is a familiar model in the Canadian context. Uh, uh, Canadian governments that don't have to wrap their heads around, uh, around new models. Um, the funding can be based on an assessment of the needs of the population. Saskatchewan in particular has uh, experimented with this. It's not always the case, uh, but it does allow for funding that's based on an, uh, an assessment of the, uh, for example, the age makeup of the population or particular disease burden in the population. Um, so uh, it, it does have that advantage. The composition and authority of these agencies can be adapted to different contexts, whether they're elected or appointed, um, just what the scope of their responsibility is. But as a, on the con side, uh, this remains a, an essentially centralized model. These are bodies reporting to a central government, um, and they have proved to be notoriously unstable whenever they've been tried. The, the central government keeps changing the boundaries, keeps changing the, the powers, keeps changing the um, moving from an elected to an appointed basis for members. Um, they're unstable because they're they're um, inauthentic, if you will. They're they're artificial. They're creations that are imposed on a population. They don't necessarily match uh, with the uh, with a political base and with a revenue base. It's not something I particularly recommend. Regional governments um, take account of some of those criticisms. Uh, they actually have authority at the, and, and a political base at the local level. These are, are municipal governments, typically. They can raise their own revenue as well as spend. Um, they uh, allow for accountability through elected representatives. They mean that health care is viewed in a broader context of other responsibilities of the regional government or the lo local government, and uh, they allow for local discretion. Um, 
On the downside, they may not match up with the so-called catchment area for health services. Um, you may find hospitals that sit on the boundary of one municipality that are really serving the next municipality, for example. Um, the revenue generating potential is not aligned with health care needs. Um, it, of course, that depends on the, on the country and what sorts of revenue generating powers the local governments have, but typically they're very much aligned with with property uh, and not necessarily with healthcare needs, and they still are creatures of the central government. Um, we're more, most familiar with intergovernmental transfers in Canada uh, between the federal government and the provinces. This is also true in Australia and the US in terms of their, their uh, states, the, the relationship between the federal government and the states. Um, the advantages are that uh, the, the local government in this case, the provincial government uh, has much broader spending and uh, revenue raising powers. Uh, it, uh, there's a much broader revenue base. There's a much broader catchment area. Again, they're accountable through elected representatives and view healthcare in a broader context. Um, because they have an independent constitutional base, the provinces have uh, more discretion and greater autonomy. Uh, in the Canadian context, the disadvantages are that these transfers are typically per capita, just on the basis of the population of the, of the province and not aligned with health care needs. This is something that continually comes up in pointing to the differences, for example, between Alberta and some of the Atlantic provinces. Alberta having a younger population and a richer revenue base. Uh, gets the same per capita transfer as, uh, say, New Brunswick with a much older population and a less robust revenue base. Um, the uh, revenue generating potential then is typically not aligned with, with health care needs. And uh, the transfers uh, flow into general revenue. They're not directly linked to health care. Um, most provinces, in fact, do dedicate them to health care, but they're not required to do that. Um, and again, this requires periodic uh, intergovernmental negotiation. Um, the British have experimented with an interesting model. Um, not sure how relevant it is in the Canadian context. Uh, in 1999, they reformed their constitution so that Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, which were originally different countries, um, are now again countries under the uh, under the United Kingdom, um, and they have their own uh, legislative assemblies and uh, certain powers that are devolved from the Westminster government in London. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, and there is a lump sum transfer, an annual lump sum transfer from the central government to these governments of these three countries, based on a formula, which differs across. A governments. It's not just a per capita formula. It's actually quite complex. It has to do with what the different uh, the different governments are actually spending. Um, and there's an attempt to um, to uh, ensure fairness uh, through these formulae across the uh, across the countries. They do have a broad catchment area. They're accountable through local representatives. Again, they can view healthcare in a broader context. They have greater discretion and greater autonomy. Uh, the disadvantages are that at least in the UK context, uh, these countries have very limited revenue raising potential. Scotland actually can tax its population, but it doesn't. Uh, the others uh, have very limited uh, revenue generating potential at all. Um, again, the transfers are generally treated as general revenue and, uh, and they uh, like intergovernmental transfers in Canada, these, even though it's formulaic, even though it's based on a transfer formula uh, and not periodic negotiation, the formula itself is a matter for periodic negotiation. Okay, the ones that I wanted, as I said, that I wanted to spend a bit more time on um, our social insurance, uh, in, in, uh, which is what I will focus on in this side, and then integrated care systems on the next slide. Now, this, I, I wondered about whether to raise this with you, frankly. It would be a 
big, big change. Um, and uh, it may be worth piloting in, an, in, uh, in some particular cases, or it may just be utterly irrelevant, but I'll put it out there for your consideration anyway. So this is a model in which there are separate insurance funds for different populations. Um, and that it is based on compulsory contributions from uh, the beneficiaries and in the European case from their employers. So this has a long, long history in Europe, particularly in the Netherlands and Germany, going back to the 19th century, in which these separate insurance funds were established uh, and self-governed by employers and then later by employers and employees based on contributions from both sides, from employers and employees, and, um, and subsidized by the central government, increasingly over time subsidized by the central government. They're dedicated to health. They allow for the insurance funds themselves to negotiate with providers. Um, they are at arm's length from government. Uh, they, uh, in the classic model, they were regionally based or based in certain industries under a common uh, national framework. The, the, contributions, the contribution level is set according to a national formula, typically on, in terms of how much of the wage base the employer has to, uh, has to contribute and how much of their wages the employees have to contribute. Um, the recent reforms have turned this into a somewhat more competitive model in which the insurers are not expected to, are not tied to specific regions, um, and, uh, and, they, can, and, and they, they can actually charge premiums. Um, now, in fact, the experience has been that they have stayed regionally based. That is just the nature of their market. Um, the advantages of this model is that it it really does allow for broad discretion for the funds themselves in contracting with providers. They, these really are self-governed within a very broad um, uh, national framework. So I thought I would bring it to your attention for that purpose, but it does require scale. It requires that you have a broad risk pool and a broad revenue base if you're actually going to be contributing into this fund um, as well. Um, and uh, of course, it requires an, a subsidy from general taxation. All of these models do. And there, it will require ongoing negotiation or periodic, I guess I should have said, uh, negotiation in terms of that, that central uh, contribution. So it's, uh, it, it's a, a, an, an odd idea to put before you, but uh, in some particular cases for some particular First Nations or perhaps for some consortia of First Nations, um, this might be a, a potential model to think about. And then finally, and uh, please keep me on, on time here, uh, finally, uh, I want to spend some time on uh, integrated care systems, which I actually think may have the most promise uh, for First Nations. Um, and that is, and this is a new model uh, in England. And I say England because it's not the case in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, the other three countries of the United Kingdom. So this is a model that has evolved in England over the last 30 years. Uh, England started in the 1990s, really shaking up the National Health Service, which had been a very, very uh, hierarchical organization with regional bodies, but very centralized. Um, and it, uh, it increasingly tried to decentralize by breaking up that hierarchy into pur purchasers and providers and requiring them to contract with each other. Well, as that unfolded over time, uh, this, this very market-based model of contracting didn't really match up with the, with the logic of the relationships that, had, that, that were on the ground uh, between providers and what were then purchasers and what used to be their, their local health authorities. So increasingly over time, 
the actual partners, if you will, in the in uh, the healthcare system, developed workarounds, <laughs> working around the existing legislation, to develop various partnerships across healthcare authorities, providers, local governments, and to and and these were these were kind of bottom up uh, arrangements that were developed over time. And when the leadership of the NHS changed in 2019, a, a brilliant chief executive named Simon Stephen was appoint, Stevens was appointed. He had a long history in the NHS. He'd also done some work in the US. Um, and, and he encouraged these developments um, within the existing legislation. So these partnership agreements, these partnership models developed with, with broad uh, multi-party agreements in which the lead came from different providers. Uh, it could be a hospital taking the lead, it could be a family practice, a community agency, even a local government. Um, and so over time, these, these on the ground, these partnerships were developing. In, to some extent, to get around this attempt to draw a bright line between providers and, uh, and purchasers in the system. So ultimately in 2022, this year in April, uh, it, this legislative process started a year earlier, legislation was adopted that finally recognized these partnerships, provided a broad framework in which the partnerships could operate uh, but it's very interesting to me that they were able to develop uh, without legislative change. So I offer it to you, um, I'll say a bit more about it too, but I, I offer it to you as a, as a, a model that you might think about um, if you, if you, uh, if you want to experiment with something before taking the legislative step. And that's pretty much what happened here in, in England, uh, to, to just figure out what was gonna work on the ground and, and, then, and then develop the legislation. This typically doesn't happen as you, uh, as you undoubtedly know, but it's a very interesting case in England. So the advantage of this integrated care system model, and you can call it whatever you like, this is a kind of a buzzword, integrated care, um, but it allows for variation in the design across different uh, local circumstances. So not all, all of these integrated care systems look the same. They all have the same underlying idea that they'll be based on partnerships, they'll cover a broad range of services, et cetera, but the actual design varies uh, according to local circumstances. And they are based on uh, what's coming to be called in a number of contexts, not just in this context, a relational approach to contracting. So rather than a very transactional approach uh, where uh, the, the funder specifies the deliverable that they're expecting from this, uh, from this agreement, relational contracting recognizes the importance of building long-term relationships over time. Uh, now this is, this is a, a, a kind of philosophy, if you will, of contracting rather than a, rather than a manual. Um, but, but it's a different approach to contracting that whereby various parties enter into agreements with, which, with the intention that this will be a long-term multi-party relationship and that the actions taken within these contracts will be consistent with the maintenance of a, of a long-term relationship. Now sometimes there can be a preamble uh, to the agreement that kind of sets out these expectations or sometimes those expectations are unwritten but nonetheless uh, part of the of the relationship. So there's actually quite a lot of attention now in the public policy literature to this development of relational contracting. And that's, that's what's going on in these integrated care systems. And they are self-governed with respect to allocating the budget, but 
they still do receive their budgets from the central government. They have no independent revenue base. Uh, they are, are completely dependent on general taxation um, uh, from the central government and therefore ongoing negotiation. Uh, there is a little exception to this, to the to my statement about no independent revenue base um, for local governments, uh, who which do have some revenue raising potential, and they if, if they are in many cases partners to these integrated care systems because they provide so-called social care uh, outside uh, outside hospitals and in the community, um, and this is very much a work in progress. Um, so there's there are things to be learned from England on the positive and the negative side, I'm sure, as this unfolds. Probably the closest thing that we have to this in Canada, as far as I can see, um, in Indigenous healthcare uh, governance is the BC tripartite agreement. Um, so it, it does have this kind of relational contracting aspect to it. With, it, it does have a, a preamble. Um, but the accountability so far uh, seems to be largely through the budget process, through accounting, and relational contracting really wants to move around, move away from that. Uh, not completely. You can't move completely away from a, a, a accountability based on uh, budgetary reporting. Um, but but to uh, enrich that with a broader uh, concept of, uh, of relationship and accountability. So finally, if I still have a little time, um, I, uh, to, uh, to promote your thinking, I prepared uh, this chart to think about how each of these systems stacks up in terms of the economy, uh, the amount of autonomy that they provide uh, the uh, the scale that is required to implement them, the, the capacity in terms of uh, both human and financial resources, the extent to which they accommodate diversity, and uh, the uh, the level of, of sheer the the if you will the negotiation burden that they impose uh, on a on a regular basis, the the so-called transactions cost. So I could go through them with this slide. But uh, I wonder, Mr. Chair, if uh, if this would be a time to pause and see if there are questions uh, for uh, for discussion. Right on. Thank you, Doctor Carolina. We have we do have a question on the chat, and it's from Chuck Dumetti. Please, can you elaborate a bit more on how the social insurance model in Germany and the Netherlands differs significantly from what happens in USA and Canada? Okay, um, the uh, the histories are entirely different. The histories of how the the systems developed in in Europe and in Canada and the U.S. Um, these originally developed uh, really outside. They came from models that developed outside government, uh, and they were. Um, recognized in uh, legislation in the late 19th century in Germany and the early 20th century in the Netherlands. So they kind of stem from a um, from civil society, from a partnership, from partnership agreements within civil society, as opposed to being legislation that was developed uh, at the in, at, from government and uh, and adopted in uh, in Canada and the US. Um, now there are pros and cons to that. The Can Canadian and the US systems uh, took a, a much broader approach to, uh, to universal coverage. These social insurance systems had to sort of build their way up to, uh, to universal coverage in, uh, in Europe. Um, they involve uh, a, a greater degree of autonomy at the level of the insurance fund in negotiating with providers than we typically have. It's it's basically the level of autonomy that a province would have 
in Canada in, in coming to contracts with providers. Um, so, uh, but increasingly with reforms over time, the, um, the, the European models, the social insurance models involve a greater and greater role for the, for government. Uh, governments have taken a, a stronger role in financing these insurance funds um, and, uh, and therefore, you know, having some say in how they're, how they're operated. So it is a, it's a more, um, it allows for more discretion at the, at the local level or the regional level, I guess I should say. Um, but it does, it requires, uh, it requires real capacity on the, on the part of those insurance funds. And the, the problem in translating this model into the Canadian context is that we don't have that long history. These funds built up over many decades and uh, developed their, their institutional memories and their uh, ways of doing things um, that were transmitted over time. There's real expertise in these insurance funds. Um, and you know, trying to create that from scratch in Canada is a is a heavy, heavy lift. So um, if I, I would I would suggest this for consideration only in certain circumstances, um, and perhaps perhaps there are no such circumstances in Canada. But it is an interesting model um, to uh, at least have on the menu. I think. I hope that's helpful. We got a question in the room, and I'm going to take it to uh, Chief Nipnak. Thank you. I, I appreciate the the ability to be a little interactive in the presentation because it it allows us to uh, share thoughts and raise questions in real time with um, with the presenters. And I, I think it's um, something that I might have raised with with Carolyn in the past is the concept of um, uh, replacing the limited. Uh, health benefits that you access through your your status Indian number with a, a more robust and detailed and accessible plan that we design as as treaty people for the benefit of our community members both employed and and non-employed and I think that's where the social insurance option um, developing you know insurance programs and policies for our communities could really come into play and I'm thinking in the context of today's political evolution, we see more communities aggregating around their home treaties. Um, for example, Treaty 1 is, is formalizing economically and politically right now. Treaty 2 in the last number of years has, has aggregated politically under constitution and, and we're not going to get when uh, new laws that are being drafted inclusive of, of, of the, the citizenry. If you took an, a, a, a political aggregate like Treaty 2 with its approximately 20,000 community members on and off reserve, uh, spread out geographically throughout the Treaty 2 territory. Is, is that a, a, a case in point where you could design a, an insurance policy that could uh, be funded or partially funded by Canada, but of course supported by you know, direct contribution from the members and um, take, the, take the place of the existing very limited types of uh, FINIB related benefits that are constantly being peeled back and away from our community members. Is that a consideration, Carolyn? I, I think that is a, I think that's a really brilliant um, uh, notion. Um, and I had not, I had not thought of that. Uh, but, um, but I, one thing I should have pointed out about these, uh, about these models is they do allow for levels within. Um, so the insurance funds, um, th this is less true of the insurance model than of a social insurance model than of the integrated care model. But, um, but you, if you think originally about the social insurance model, um, I'll just dr draw an analogy, there was the insurance fund, which could be, it could be uh, uh, for a single employer actually, if it was a large enough employer, but it was typically for an industry, but it also allowed for discretion at the level of the local firm. 
So, um, so one could imagine the treaty uh, aggregation as the overall insurance uh, fund. The, it would have the it would have the 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 uh, broad enough risk pool and uh, revenue base to participate, um, and yet you could still have some local discretion. Um, so I think thinking on, about it at a, at a treaty level is a, a really interesting, uh, interesting suggestion. And may, it may allow for some kind of translation of this model into the Canadian context. I'd, I'd really like to pursue that idea with you, uh, Chief Nipanak. That's a that's a, a very good thought. Thank you, Karen. Chief Nipanak, any additional comments to Carolyn's response? Okay. Any more questions online? Any questions in the room? I noted one uh, chat comment that. Uh, popped up on my screen that the integrated care model would seem consistent with, uh, with indigenous ways. Um, and, uh, and I would, uh, I would agree with that. Um, in that, um, the, the closest analogy in the, uh, in the English context is that there was a, a group in Devon that was, uh, a, a family practice that was really trying to involve, um, what uh, in, in their terms would be non-conventional uh, caregivers uh, and particularly um, an interest in uh, connecting with the uh, with the natural environment. They were trying to work out a way of, of funding this kind of approach to healthcare and uh, and they struggled under previous models. My understanding is that the integrated care model is making it somewhat more, uh, possible to explore those those uh, interconnections. So it may be that uh, that the integrated care system model is the is the most appropriate one. Alrighty, we got two questions online. Questions from Paul. Given the challenges in the deliber uh, deliberating on the institutional options for healthcare delivery, might it be a good idea to suggest the creation of a national national institution? With the legislative mandate to provide expert advice to First Nations and governments. Hmm. Um, would that be possibly? I, I wonder if that is too uh, too sweeping um, across the across the diversity of First Nations. But that I mean, I I can't uh, I I can't respond for you on that but um, uh, but there could be a kind of uh, bank I suppose of people that you could draw on uh, that could be identified federally does that make sense Paul if you want to elaborate the, on on your question or reply to uh, Caroline's response to your question my floor is yours All right, we see Paul is having a little tech difficulties. We're going to go to the next question. It's from Inez Vistrasil from MKO, CN. The integrated model seems to be to fit naturally with our indigenous ways. That, that was the one that I uh, had noticed that popped up on my screen that I responded to earlier. And that, I think, uh, I think, yes, I mean, if you ask me now which of the models I presented, uh, I, I would recommend to you for uh, pursuing further, it would be the integrated care model. The social insurance model is, is a kind of uh, outside the box idea that I, I thought it would be useful to, uh, to put out to you, but certainly there's been a more 
closely related experience with integrated care systems um, and for the Indigenous context than with, with social insurance. Although I, I do like Chief Nipanak's idea of the treaty level aggregation. And to the first question, we got the secondary uh, question there. Could the relational contracting and its unwritten expectations potentially lead to the similar situation with the treaties? Uh, oh, I'm not, I'm not sure I quite understand that question. Um, that, that was the first question that uh, when the uh, representative from Four Arrows Regional Health Authority asked. Could you elaborate a bit more on the how the social insurance model in Germany and Netherlands differs significantly from what happens in U.S. and Canada? And she asked another question, or maybe it was the same question. Could could the relational contracting and its unwritten expectations potentially lead to the similar situation with the treaties? So, um, if I understand the question um, uh, appropriately or, or correctly, uh, is there a way to um, is there a way through relational contracting to um, uh, to in ensure the sort of long term relationship that the treaties were aimed at, and how do we how do we avoid the problems that have uh, been experienced with the treaty relationship? Is that what the is that the nature of the question? Um, if I may answer here. Um, thank you for your um, lecture. It was very interesting. My question is, you said during relational contracting, there are some unwritten expectations. So I'm asking, this is the problem we have some of with the treaty. Yeah. The yeah. indigenous people made a lot of oral presentations, which were not captured in the treaties. And what is in the treaty was not what they implied. So when we talk about unwritten, right. that's what the question is. Thank you. Yes. Okay. I, I thought that I thought that was what what you were getting at. Um, so, uh, the relational contracting, as I think I said, is very much a work in progress, and it is um, to some extent what you make of it. Um, it is the, the the fundamental idea behind it is that you are committing through a relational contract. You are committing to a long term relationship. You are committed to what it takes to make the long-term relationship work. So any particular transaction within that contract cannot be um, operating against the goal of keeping those parties together in a relationship going forward. So I think um, I, it's, a, it's a different um, potentially anyway, a, a different mindset than the treaty mindset. Um, I mean, maybe treaties should have been struck that way, um, but, uh, but the relational contracting is, is specifically about maintaining and nurturing a relationship over time and making sure that the contractual, um, the subcontracts, if you will, within it, serve that overall goal. Now that, that's the, as I said, that's a philosophy. That's the set of expectations. But in other work I do, I really emphasize that in any institution building, expectations matter, especially initial expectations. But some of my colleagues identify institutions as collectively enforced expectations. And I actually think that is a, quite a, a, a brilliant way of thinking about institutions. Um, we, we have these shared expectations and we also have ways of enforcing those expectations on each other and that's and so relational contracts are about that you know specification of the of the expectations up front and then how do we go about enforcing these along the way all right on thank you uh paul you can give me the floor to, for any uh additional comments to caroline's response to your question if you have any additional comments. 
I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I believe you're, are, are you addressing me? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to deal with the system and I'm just not sure what I'm being asked. Uh, it's a matter of sound and so on. Uh, I need a little bit of help, please. Your question in the chat, given the challenges in the deliberating on the institutional options for healthcare delivery, might it be a good idea to suggest the creation of a national institution with a legislated mandate to provide expert advice to First Nations and governments? Yes. You're asking me the question, or no? That was your that was your question in the chat. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Yes, it was. Uh, uh, my observation is that the matter of moving from the status quo, where there's no legislation, a lack of institutions to deliver um, health care services to treaty nations, the communities of which are scattered. Uh, given the challenges uh, identified uh, by the uh, Royal Commission in uh, the, uh, pointing out the great need for administrative uh, capacity and training uh, the, the, across uh, the spectrum from, from all the medical professionals to the office administrators. Uh, the experts who did these studies in the 1990s concluded that much had to be done. So there are some real challenges, it, it seems, that uh, there's a need to improve the professional capacity and, and, and also uh, we're going from a situation where there was nothing in, in, in terms of institutions, uh, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, as we have heard this morning, the various models are not really simple. They have to be adapted to local circumstances. So it seems to me this requires a lot of careful observation and balancing. And it requires a particular expertise, it seems to me, to do that. And that kind of expertise is limited, I think. And, you know, so um, I'm just wondering if uh, it would not be uh, helpful uh, to um, create a, a national institution, the uh, function of which would be to provide the necessary advice to both governments and to uh, First Nations uh, uh, across the country. And my final uh, uh, point I'd make is that the idea of national institutions to assist Indigenous people is one that has a, a bit of a history over the last uh, about quarter century uh, in Canada, where uh, um, particularly when uh, Lloyd Axworthy was a foreign affairs minister, uh, he, he had an interest in uh, look, uh, along with uh, Mexico in looking at the uh, possible role of the former Inter-American Indian Institute as national institutions of anthropologists who studied indigenous people. And the question was, gee, we think that the situation of state indigenous relations in North and South America suggests that we ought to take these old institutions and replace them and make them new institutions, national institutions that would have the role of assisting Indigenous people to improve the state Indigenous relationships in all aspects. And so applying those general ideas to the particular circumstance of the federal proposal for federal health care delivery, I'm just wondering, uh, might there not be a role for uh, a federal institution? Otherwise, uh, is it the case that each of the First Nations, small communities or other institutions are going to find themselves in a situation where they're shopping around for advice and so on. And uh, not everyone has the requisite uh, uh, expertise. I, I certainly don't have the expertise to uh, deal with the complexity of the, uh, the structures that are that that are needed, uh, you know, for local and regional circumstances. So that, that's the thinking behind my question. Uh, I don't know if that helps, and I, I, but anyway, Mr. Chairman, that's my attempt to explain what I had in mind, which may have little or no merit.
Thank you, Paul. So we'll take it over to Car Caroline for uh, comments and response to Paul's question and his comments. Caroline. Uh, yes, so thank you, Paul, for uh, for elaborating that. Uh, and I apologize. I think I have a telephone ringing in the background here. I hope it's not too distracting. Um, so uh, I I was too uh, I was too quick. I think to respond to the, uh, the the notion that you're putting out, and um, and was wondering about the capacity to accommodate the diversity of circumstances across across First Nations, but um, but there are, you know, as I've been suggesting in my presentation, there are models themselves that can accommodate diversity, and and uh, having some um, expertise on those sorts of models. Uh, I think uh, could could be helpful if we thought about this as a as a resource for First Nations upon which they could draw voluntarily. Um, then I I think it would uh, it it could be a it could be a, a significant contribution. But it's it's uh, it's an initiative I think that should certainly come from uh, from First Nations themselves, from Indigenous people themselves. To uh, I wouldn't want to see that the federal government sort of unilaterally setting up an advisory, in, well, it wouldn't do it uh, unilaterally, but even taking the initiative to set up an advisory uh, institute without uh, without the initiative coming from Indigenous people themselves. But a bank of experts uh, could be could be a very good idea. And the development, actually, of a, of a cadre of experts, there are too few people um, I think who are in this space, and um, and so encouraging the development of a of a cadre of experts would be would be a very good move. Thank you, Caroline. So does that conclude your presentation? Uh, it does, if you uh, if you wish it to be. I had. Uh, oh. Uh, I have that that graph, that chart uh, on uh, that I, you know, if we wanted to, we could have walked through the various models. Uh, but I think I should just leave that with you as a as a kind of prompt to thinking about the uh, the different models and their pros and cons. Uh, some of them uh, allow for more autonomy than than others. Some of them require uh, or accommodate different levels of scale. The integrated care system model is a multi-level model, so you can build different levels of, of scale into it. Um, the, uh, the social insurance model requires a, a base and a scope, but uh, we've already had a very interesting suggestion of how that might be dealt with. So, uh, so there are pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages across these systems, and uh, and I just I, I hope I've given you a framework in which to make some of those trade-offs. So that concludes Dr. Caroline Tui's presentation on place-based options for First Nations healthcare delivery and governance. What do models in other countries have to offer? And again, these presentations are made available from Finissum. You know, just request them and they'll be emailed to you. But we're going to go to the reflections from our lead facilitator, Chief Derek Nipanak. And Caroline, if you want to chime in on uh, Chief Nipanak's comments, you're more than welcome. Chief. Pretty much. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to provide as, as much commentary or reflections uh, on the presentations uh, that have been this morning because there's it's mostly content. It's mostly stuff for all of us to reflect upon, and, and and you know my ideas are just one of the the great the great many numbers of of different um, perspectives that have to inform this discussion as we move forward in time and and move towards refined um, processes and uh, and 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 ideas on on how to how to move towards you know the legislative process. What I what I'd like to do, I guess, is to move towards wrapping up our session. Um, we've asked, you know, for your for your 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 ears and your your thoughts over the last uh, two business days, um, as we've as we've put a, put forward a lot of different information. And of course, yesterday we did we did, um, I guess, provide the the first iteration of what we'll call principles and recommendations, um, coming from this 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 level of engagement. 
And I don't know if, if everyone's received a copy. Has this been handed out? Because I know it's not, it's not in this book, but it is, uh, it's a separate handout that is called Principles and Recommendations. Okay, so it has been, it has been distributed. <clears throat> and I'm just going to go over them very, very briefly here once again, um, just as a reminder of what, we was, what was touched upon yesterday. And I think Paul had done a very thorough uh, discussion on this identifying first, you know, guiding principles as we move forward in time. And, you know, these principles will be opportunities for, for each participant to take back and have broader discussions around your, your home fires and your tables that, that, uh, that you operate within your respective networks. Um, <clears throat> of course, the leading principle starts out primarily, I guess, as a, almost as a declaratory statement, um, recognizing Canada's federal and provincial governments have made unilateral decisions concerning health and well-being of First Nations, whereby these governments have imposed policies and law on First Nations and those who belong to them. The First Nations in Manitoba have not been allowed to participate in the processes of executive federalism that have generated intergovernmental accords that affect their health and well-being, including the social and health transfer accords. And um, I think that's an important note because I think in 2014, it might have been 13, there was a time when, you know, the health accord and the social accords were up for discussion at a constitutional debate, and I made a public comment that we should have been there as Indigenous people, and I think um, either Sean Atlio or, or um, Perry Belgard ev eventually did end up observing the process uh, out, of, out of some of our, our discussion. I don't think that we had an express role in those negotiations in any way, it was more of a figurehead role uh, just to let everybody know that, hey, there's Indigenous people starting to pay attention to how these federal um, transfer payments are being constructed and negotiated. Um, affirming the views expressed by the chiefs in Manitoba and Wabung are tomorrow's 1971. Our attachment means that we must commit ourselves to help develop healthy societies for all the peoples who live upon the land, but we will not be able to contribute unless we have the means first to develop a healthy society for ourselves. Since the signing of treaties 100 years ago, we have been constantly and consistently prevented from doing so. <clears throat> we maintain that the health services should be included in federal health legislation respecting the rights of Indians. And I believe that this is a really good position, a really strong principle to stand upon as, um, as you know, the... Um, I guess the, the, the leaders of today reflecting on the, the strong leadership we had uh, a couple of few generations back with the leaders of, uh, of Wabung, um, the, the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood. Acknowledging the unfinished constitutional business of the 1980s where First Nations meeting with the government in Canada failed to reach decisions on implementing the treaty relationship and that the decisions of the courts of one treaty party is not a legitimate avenue to reconciliation. And this goes back to... Um, you know, some of the early work we did as well, uh, when, you know, the Stephen Harper government was talking with uh, Sean Atlio at the time at the AFN about, um, you know, common guiding principles that were pre prescribed to, uh, as an outcome of a meeting that hadn't happened yet. Um, you know, we, we brought forward a, a new document, which we called Unfinished Business, uh, and that was sourced out of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs talking about unfinished business of constitutional discussions that were had in the 1980s. And, and of course, the last one, I think, being, um, it was either, it might have been 1990, the last one happening. But recognizing that there was still that unfinished business left on the table. And uh, I think that's very appropriately included in our, in our, our, um, our principled position. Emphasizing the principles and obligations in Canada's Constitution Act 1982, particularly Section 35, 35.1, 36, and the former Section 37. Emphasizing also that consent and the rule of law are fundamental features of the Constitution that apply to negotiations on treaty nation, federal health legislation. Affirming that the process and final substance of federal treaty, treaty nation health legislation must reflect the highest standards of good faith respect for self-determination and compliance with all the human rights standards that bind Canada in particular, be guided by the binding standards of international customary law that are outlined in the 2000 General Comment on the provisions of the ICESCR Treaty. 
recognizing and striving for cost effectiveness that traditional medicine and practices reduce costs for healthcare. Now, I, I did raise uh, a comment on that yesterday. I did mention that um, it's my personal belief that cost reduction is not a motivating factor uh, for, for governments when it comes to spending on Indigenous health services. Um, although it is publicly, I believe that it is um, um, not entirely the case when we look at the economics behind the Canadian health system and how profitable it is for them to have a, a captured audience with, with the Status Indian. Um, that is most of us in the room who carry the Status Indian card, I think. Uh, recommendations. That the timetable for cooperative engagement be revised to set realistic timelines. That's a, a broad recommendation at this time. It may, may, take, a, it may take a more, uh, a more detailed um, consideration as we move forward. The process be rationalized with federal plans for treaty implementation and fulfilling government section 35 obligations. Uh, the process as well as a final program and legislation must reflect the elements of the human rights standards that apply to Indigenous people and that require Canada to adopt a national framework and provide funding and other assistance to First Nations. That federal legislation protect and promote traditional medicine and healing practices. I raise the um, a thought here as well, something you can take with you is, you know, between number two and number three, the process be rationalized for, for treaty implementation and then number three, processes as, as well as final program must reflect elements of human rights standards that apply to Indigenous people. What is the difference between uh, treaty implementation and applying human rights standards to Indigenous people? Is that something we, we need to spend more time thinking about? Perhaps, perhaps it may be. Is there a difference between human rights and, and, and treaty rights? Um, other than to say there was some, some are individual, some are collective. Um, there's, there's a fine line there, but where is it? And, and, and who believes in what? Um, do, do governments believe in the implementation of treaty rights or are they happy to proceed on the basis of, of creating some, some form of recognizable equality under human rights standards? And that may be where a lot of the government's willingness to engage in this legislative framework discussion um, exist is within the realm of, of you know, the, the pursuit of equality under, under individual human rights as opposed to the treaty. And if that's the premise, then how is that going to impact, you know, treaty rights holders in, in the discussion space moving forward? So these are all outstanding, I think, matters that are going to have to be worked on and discussed as we move forward. Recommendation number five, the standards derived from the honour of the Crown require the participation of CIRNAC, CERNAC is, I believe, the Crown Indigenous Relations Minister or Department. Um, have a statutory mandate to work towards treaty implementation and all engagements towards federal treaty nation health legislation. The approach recommended by the federal RCAP 1996 be considered and in particular the need for a national strategy to increase and improve administrative capacity and training. And I believe that that may be where Paul's question to Dr. Tui might might uh, might be most relevant is do we need new newly minted national public institutions to act as intermediaries in terms of you know framing and scoping out and providing best practices in the development and evolution of health systems in Canada for indigenous people i think that is that's a a very very uh, important piece of the discussion because we currently don't have that in place and um how are we going to get there if we, if, if we don't have a, a place to go to? Um, that's going to be obviously part of the details of, of moving forward. That consideration be given to the creation of new national institutions, provide assistance on the design and implementation of local health care institutions and processes. And six, I guess, ties into seven that way as well. So um, all very good thoughts, considerations to be made. Um, this forum is not intended to be prescriptive by any means. It's, in, it's, entitled, it's intended to, I guess, to, to stir the pot a little bit and to get you thinking about where we're going to be headed, you know, within the political discussion space in the months to come. Um, time, as I said before, thinking politically, time may be of the essence in this discussion. It's important for us, I think, to recognize uh, when the stars align politically between what some of our aspirations are as Indigenous people uh, 
living within the nation state of Canada and what you know a, a liberal government is uh, is willing to do to uh, to work with us uh, to achieve its mandate and to um, I guess harmonize some of the harmonize some of the the challenges we face um, you know collectively. Uh, there's going to be a day when there's going to be an election. You know we don't know when that will be, but uh, there will be one. There certainly is always an election on the horizon somewhere. And, um, you know, I think that it's important that we recognize the window of opportunity that's upon us right now. I had said in my opening comments yesterday, when we originally raised the discussion around uh, an Indian Health Act and, and legislation that was going to be pertinent and important to the, the health and well-being of, of our people, I sat down with then Minister Leona Aglukak, who was a conservative minister in the Stephen Harper government, and she absolutely refused to discuss legislation. She said the Canada Health Act is not on the table for discussion in the meeting that we had. And, and um, that really, other than disappointing me, that, that really cooled our, our process. It, it, it cooled us off quite a bit, knowing that you know we were going to have to work with, uh, with a government that was really... I, I would say uh, going to take difficult uh, positions that they weren't going to be budging from. Today, like I said, the opportunity is different. The window of opportunity is open, and um, not saying that you know it's 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 that different. It's just that we have different different people and different minds, different political ideologies that are that are open to hearing and and funding different processes that um, that we bring forward. And uh, with that said, I think that that's, that's important for us to follow up on. Not to close doors because we're afraid of the future or uncertain as to how it will impact our treaty, but to go forward bravely into the future to see what, what, uh, what kind of world we can create for our future generations. So um, this is intended to be an interactive discussion. And, um, you know, we do have participants online. We do have participants in the room as well. And uh, I'd, I'd really hope for a little more commentary from the, from the, the um, participating folks in the room and, in, in, and online. We do have a microphone that can make its way around the table if there's any questions uh, for anybody, whether it be myself or whether it be for our, our experts that we brought in for, for, for their assistance. Um, I think Paul and, and, and Dr. Tui are both still online listening in. Um, but also any follow-up commentary that we may have uh, going forward. It's very important. We're comfortable in, 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 the, in, in moving forward and how we're thinking about this and, and uh, questions should be raised. Um, this is, a, this is a, like I say, a, a, new, a new space for us to venture into. So those are my thoughts, and uh, I appreciate you listening to me. Miigwech. Thank you. Chief Nipanak, from Pine Creek First Nation. You know, he was our lead facilitator for the last few days. As he mentioned, this is the first of few seminars that's going to happen, engagement seminars. The next one is October 19th and 20th with all the chiefs in Manitoba. So we encourage the technicians of, you know, the staff you know, to come participate. It's going to be our second one, seminar series. It's going to be here in Winnipeg at the Clarion Hotel, Polo Park. So that's October 19th and the 20th. So that'll be our second second engagement seminar series. And I'll be with the First Nation of the leadership from uh, across Manitoba. So it'll be well attended. And we encourage you to participate and come again. And But at this time, again, we'd like to acknowledge the delegates that did show up here, you know, this is your meeting. You know, uh, we see representatives from Peguis, Pimitsigamak, AMC, Musi Sayagan, Moose Lake. Thank you, and uh, and our delegates online. You know, we had representatives from the Four region, uh, Four Arrows Regional Health Authority. Seen the representatives from MKO. It, it was good. So again, I'd like to announce that it's the the uh, it's October 19th and 20th, so our second engagement seminar series, and that's going to be led again, facilitated by Chief uh, Derek Nipanak, and the uh, we can uh, 
if you can make it, we can uh, hook you up with the, the, uh, the virtually as well, that meeting. It's going to be made available. But also, all the presentations and documents and they're made available by Finissim. Just upon request, they'll email them to you. And if the uh, if you need any any more information for your community, you know Finissim text and staff, they're always there available to help you and assist you any way they can. So at this time, I'm going to uh, <coughs> ask our uh, our elder, our representative from Pegasus. Doris Bear, and you know, she open her, open us up with a prayer on day one. So you know we're going to close it off with the prayer for day two. And it's, wish everybody safe travels back to their home fires, and uh, everybody that's online. You know we appreciate uh, your participation, and I just want to acknowledge the staff and the techs at Finissim for you know for all the preparation for the uh, for the meeting. You know, it takes a lot of work and you know, all the presentation, the documents and all the booklets that are provided. You know, it takes a lot of work and time. And uh, these these documents, this booklet has all the presentations are made available to you. So you can be sent to your office, to your community and also our tech team. You know, they, they make this uh, meeting happen virtually, 47 Filmworks and their techs from uh, Vanessum. Shane. Better seen than Pat and Pamela. Alrighty, so we're gonna take it over to Doris. We can get him a floor mic for Doris. The protocol was followed. Tobacco was offered to her, and we get you know ask about that Doris for you know blessing us with the, your prayer. Uh, thank thank you for uh, inviting me to to uh, open up uh, the prayer and. Uh, to have the closing prayer. Uh, These two days were very uh, exciting for me, and uh, it's good to be uh, here with everyone with all their knowledge and expertise in, in health transformation. So with that, I will uh, begin my prayer. Uh, Lord, thank you for the wisdom and uh, support that you have given all of our leaders here today. And also, in, in this new way of health transformation. There's a lot to be learned and there's a lot to be uh, f for our communities that uh, we don't have uh, much going for them. And help each of our leaders in each of the communities to get what, what is right, what they need for their own people. We don't need our treaty rights to be eroded any further or any more. We need, we need to identify our own roles, responsibilities in, in this health transformation. Also, Lord, give, I give thanks for uh, everyone here that's in attendance for their healing, their mind, body, and spirit for our families and communities. And Lord, place your hand upon each and every one of us here. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So that concludes our uh, first uh, engagement seminar. We'll see you at the Clarion Hotel in a couple weeks. So for, any, for, for, for any further information on the second meeting, just contact the Finissam office. Thank you. Sandy. Thank you.